Eventually, we feel used, abused, angry, underappreciated. Boundary boss Terry Cole draws the line. And for all you people pleasers out there, she'll tell you where you're headed and warned you about the dangers of not setting boundaries with a narcissistic mother. They're going to use whatever you share with them against you at some point. Terry Cole, the boundary boss, is in the house. She is indeed, Lisa, <laughs> she is indeed. So where I wanna start today is so many of the things that I think um, us as women struggle with, feeling like we're pushed around, feeling like that we don't have a voice, feeling like we're being manipulated without us even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you talk about so eloquently is the fact that a lot of us have so many poor boundaries that we don't even realize that these sorts of problems are stemming from the fact that we have poor boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I would love today to identify how on earth we know if we have a poor boundary or not, and then how we um, pivot, how we then set up a successful boundary for us to then have a close relationship with the people around us. Love it. So let's start with how do you know your boundaries are disordered. How do you know that what you're feeling is related to that? Or you're, if you're feeling dissatisfied or if you're feeling angry? So we always start with doing a resentment inventory. So this is like the beginning. If you're wondering, like, huh, I wonder how my boundaries are. The real thing to check in with is how is your resentment? So you can start to identify what relationships need your attention in respect to boundaries. And let's reestablish what boundaries are. It's you, like think of it as your own personal rules of engagement, right? Mm. You letting other people know what's okay with you and what's not okay with you. And a lot of us don't do that, right? From the get, mm -hmm. we're, we're waiting to see if something's gonna be not okay. And then maybe we will do something about it and maybe we, we won't, or we positively project onto the other person. Like, well, if I'm like this, then they're like this. And again, not accurate because we need evidence to see how people are. So back to what do you do? You identify, I'm feeling resentful with my sister. She expects me to do X, Y, and Z. She's entitled or she borrowed money and didn't pay it back or I'm angry with my work partner or whatever it is. Those, that literally, that's where you have disordered boundaries. So that's a start. And then you have to look at that situation and go, okay, what is my 50% of this experience? Is my sister entitled or do I serve myself up on a silver platter to be quote unquote taken advantage of? Doing more than we want to, over giving, over functioning, overdoing, being overly generous, even over feeling most of us. And then when the person believes us or takes us up on it, we're like pissed and feel like they're taking advantage of us. So when we can own our own 50%, like was I clear that lending $1,000 to my sister or my friend, that it was a loan? And did I say when I would expect that loan to be repaid? And listen, P.S., my two cents on lending money, never do it. Just don't. Mm -hmm. Just have a policy. Instead, when someone asks you to borrow money, even if you have a lot of money, it's never just about dollars and cents it will always become some kind of a shit show, mm -hmm. like 98% of the time. So I just have a something you can say, hey, I just have a no lending policy, it's not personal to you. If I can afford to gift it to someone, I do, right? That's a choice right. if you wanna give it to them, but that's now it's a clean exchange. And if the person's like, why I wanna borrow it from you, you can just say, hey, it's not personal. This is how I protect my relationships because money is not just about money, it gets complicated. I'm happy to brainstorm with you ways for you to make the money that you need or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you know that, if, you, if that's a way that you can know your own boundary and be ready when someone asks you. So long way around the barn, back to your question. We identify our grievances, basically, our resentments. And then we look and go, oh, where was I unclear? Did I expect them to read my mind? Or did I say it, did they agree, and are they violating our boundary agreement? Because each one of those things is a different situation. Right. So you would handle each one of them differently. That's what I was actually gonna ask you because when it comes to resentment, there are multiple factors when it comes to that. Was it 
they were entitled and it's them and now I haven't spoken up about the entitlement so now I'm holding on to resentment. Is it the fact that I haven't set boundaries and so it's not that they're entitled, it's just that I've never told them no. So they're just gonna keep asking and so actually that's more of a me thing where I need to see mm -hmm. and look inside myself. Um, and then as you were saying about like with the resentment and where you are, I think so many of us, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, how we convince ourselves that it's on us, that it's our fault. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, first of all, even, I want to first speak to the entitlement piece, because even if we, we don't know what's going on with someone else, we don't know if they feel entitled, are entitled. It's all, when it comes to our boundaries, it's always an us thing. Mm. Because we are the keeper. We are the one who knows what is our preference, our limits, and our deal breakers. And those are your boundaries. What someone else is doing, the dance that they're doing on their own side of the street, whether you like the dance, you don't like the dance, maybe they are acting entitled, maybe they say you owe me, that's them. You have to take responsibility for your, your part, mm -hmm. for being clear, for precisely, right, accurately, transparently communicating your boundaries, which is why it's so important to be proactive. Mm. So if you have a no lending policy, that's proactive. So you're not taken aback in the moment, right? You, you know, if someone asked me to borrow money, I have a no lending policy, it's not personal to you. Or, and maybe I can gift it to you if I can, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the second thing you asked, which is about, we take it on ourselves. We feel like it's our fault that something happens. Now this goes under the category of a lot of times the lies we tell ourselves, right, I call it, to avoid speaking up, to avoid having a conversation that might be difficult or maybe that we feel like we are not, um, we don't have the skills to have. We're like, I just don't know what to say to this person and I'm worried that they're gonna be angry, upset, reject me, that I won't be liked. I mean, it, listen, we may not say that with words, but at the base, so much of disordered boundaries has to do with people pleasing. Like we want people to like us. I was saying this the other day at some talk that I was giving, like literally it could be someone you don't even like. <laughs> and then you find out that Betty doesn't like you and you're like, what are, why doesn't Betty, what, what I do to Betty? That's why wouldn't so she true. like me? <laughs> why do we care? Why do we? What is that then? Oh, part of it is that we're trained to be likable. Mm. If you were raised as a woman, think about all of the um, indoctrination mm. that happened in our lives. Be a good girl, turn that frown around. Where's my happy girl? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like I could keep going. <laughs> And this is what got us positivity. Yeah. Mm. And um, it was reinforced, most of us, by the adults in our life. And all we want is for them to approve of us and to love us and to not reject us. Because think about with kids, we learn how to get our needs met to the best of our ability. So if you, you were raised in a dysfunctional family system, maybe you had an alcoholic parent you, no one needed to tell you how to manage that person. You figure it out. I'm gonna refresh mommy's drink. I'm gonna clean up. I'm gonna make dinner for the other kids so mommy can be in a good mood and just stay here, right? Nobody, there was no inner office memo that told you how to do mm. that. So there's so much of our young experience has to do with our adult experience. And even if you didn't, weren't raised in a dysfunctional situation, we still, just by being raised, at least when we were being raised, mm -hmm. right, within that period of time, but it's been for all of life that women are supposed to be pleasant. We're supposed to care more about how other people feel and other people's comfort or discomfort than our own. That's what we learned. Now, mm -hmm. of course, we know that is a recipe for endless self-abandonment and the least satisfying life possible mm -hmm. is let me just make sure everyone else has what they need because what ends up happening, and this will bring us into the conversation about codependency because it's all connected, but what ends up happening when we prioritize the wants, needs, desires, 
preferences, likes, dislikes of all the other people in our life above our own. Is that, that literally is a one way, you know, what do I, I like to say, it's like a slow train to bitter land. Mm -hmm. There's no other stop on that train. There's no other way that you will end up feeling. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we feel used, abused, angry, underappreciated, and who, who does that help? When we think we're doing all of this self-sacrificing mm -hmm. for like the greater good, mm -hmm. taking one for the team, or mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever other lies we sort of tell ourselves about why we're doing it, and learning the language, becoming fluent in the language of boundaries liberates you from this groundhog day of frustration in life. And when we have disordered boundaries, you also have to think about, are we really being honest to with ourselves, the people, honest. to ourselves, but also with the people mm -hmm. in our life? If we're saying yes, when we really want to say no, because well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, so I'll say yes or I'll say, I'll do something, even though I don't want to do that thing. Are we being nice? It's all of that is under the umbrella mm -hmm. of, well, I don't, I just, you know, I want, I said it to be nice. You're like, you said something dishonest to be nice. Mm -hmm. Is that being nice? Hell no. It is literally giving the people in your life corrupted data about who you are. Mm -hmm about what you like, even the small things. Like my, my therapy clients, when I would talk about their preferences, like what are your preferences in the beginning of the book and the way that I teach it, we do a huge list, the okay and not okay list. So that you really go through every single area of your life, from home life to relationships, to physical wellness, to financial, to spiritual, all of it. And you're like, what's really working and what's not working? Mm -hmm. And so much of the time, we are tolerating so much that it's completely unnecessary and there are small changes and usually with people we start with making the small changes where you start caring about your own preferences. It may be something as simple as having like a caustic overhead light in your work area or in one of the rooms in your home that every time you put it on you think, I really hate that light. Change the fucking bulb. Don't use that light. Get a floor lamp that you do like. And there are so many ways that we can make our lives more, like more aligned with our preferences without it being a burden to someone else. You know? Oh, that, that's so strong. Um, and I didn't want to interrupt you because you're Please so do. on fire. Go. I know, it was so on fire. I wanted to ask you, though, that in moments where you, maybe you're feeling the resentment, right? So that's that's one of the signs. Okay, if you're feeling the resentment, mm -hmm. it usually means something. Write it down, figure out where that comes from. Um, how much should we be going back into our childhood to see where it stems from? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you know we talk about is like with utter grace, right? Looking back into your childhood and not beating yourself up over the fact that maybe you were silent, maybe you didn't speak up, mm -hmm. but at least identifying it so that you can then implement it into the boundary that you need today. Yes, so good. Here's the thing, being aware of why you are the way you are. So mm -hmm. I talk about it like we, we reveal your unique um, downloaded boundary mm -hmm. blueprint. So we learned this, there was modeled behavior. There's so many good reasons that we don't know anything about how to healthily establish and maintain boundaries in our lives. Because not only were we not taught it, most of us, we were taught the opposite of it. And all the myths that abound around boundaries. Mm -hmm. That if you have good boundaries, you're a bitch, you're hysterical, you're bossy, you're not feminine, you're mean, whatever, whatever, whatever the whole thing is. And you know, we have to look at those things as well. But how you can figure out like is the way that I'm responding right now, now? Or is it really being fueled by unresolved ori original injuries, basically, mm. from the past? Is something happens when we start to have a transference to other people. And a transference is basically having a reaction to something now that is, and the, the now is very fam familiar in some way. It's similar to something that happened to you in the past. Mm -hmm. So what was adaptive in childhood, perhaps our silence in childhood, protected us from abuse. 
perhaps our, our silence got us the love that we needed, got us the care that we needed. So super adaptive, makes sense. Like, wow, go you little person that you somehow figured that out with nobody telling you yeah. it. So much of that becomes maladaptive in adulthood. And instead of it getting us what we need or keeping us safe, wow. it blocks us from getting what we need. So if you find yourself in a situation where something happens and you get activated really quick or you get really hot really fast, this can be an indication that you're having a transference from something from the past. So I give you these questions that you can ask yourself. Who does this person remind me of? Where have I felt like this before? Or how or why is this behavioral dynamic? Maybe it's approval seeking. Maybe the person is withholding mm. that approval. How is this dynamic familiar? If you ask yourself those questions, you might go, oh my God, I'm relating to my boss like my withholding father. But now is not then. And my boss is not my withholding father. How can I change my behavior so I don't turn into a 10 year old when I'm interacting with my boss. And sometimes it's simply bringing it from the basement, which is your unconscious mind, into the main part of the house, I like to say. That sometimes is enough for you to go, oh look, that thing is happening. But I don't need to be afraid of my boss the way that I was afraid of my father. So I can speak up, I can respectfully disagree, I can have the conversation they're paying me <laughs> for my thoughts. I can tell them my thoughts. Even if I disagree, my thoughts are different than their thoughts. So that's one tool that you can use is those three questions for clarity mm. because it's really helpful. But again, if you're having an amplified response and you know it, sometimes something will happen and then later you're like, oh, that was like a lot. Yeah. Like what just happened for me or my what I said or how pissed I got so fast. That seems like maybe there's something else going on. And again, I'm, I so agree with what you were saying about we're looking back with grace. We are having compassion for our little selves, mm -hmm. for the adults in our life that we can assume they did the best or maybe they didn't, but it doesn't even matter because none of this is about them. This is just about you. You want to become masterful of boundaries. It's becoming the observer without judgment of yourself and your reactions in real time where you go, that was weird or that was a lot or I wonder why I was so hurt by that person's comment, but that person is not someone I love. So how is this familiar to me? Because that pain was deep. Can it really be about my coworker? I doubt it. If you have a deep pain from someone you don't actually love, I promise you, you're most likely having a transference. Mm. And that person is reminding you mm. of someone else. I had I, I one of the stories that I share in the book. I had a client who Every job, I didn't know this in the beginning, but her first job, she comes in and she wants to talk about her arch enemy at work. She has this woman, she can't stand her, she's so entitled, she's so bossy, she's a know-it-all, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, so we started talking about that. Now, I don't see a pattern, because it's just one job. Then, she's still my client, she gets into another job. She has another arch enemy. I'm like, all right, how many people have this happen? No, this is unique to this, because she was like, I'm sure this, everyone has this. I was like, definitely not. So. This is definitely unique to you. So now we see a pattern. And I was like, we asked the three questions for clarity. Finally, I was like, all right, tell me about this person. Who do they remind you of? Where have you felt like this before? And the way you're interacting and how frustrated you are with this woman, how is that familiar to you? And she was like, oh my God, it's so embarrassing. All of these people are just like my sister, mm -hmm. who was a total bully who was, and then listed all of the qualities. And she's like, Terry, this is so weird, but it wasn't weird, this is incredibly common. And I was like, but can you see that the lady you work with is not your sister? So what do we do when we realize, oh my gosh, I'm having a transference? We go to the original injury. So with that client, mm. I went back to, with her, let's talk about 
what situations from your past with your sister are still painful to you? What have you not processed? Tell me everything. Let's talk about it, write about it, journal about it, because it was the child within her who never got the satisfaction of the sister like owning her bad behavior. And through our work, she, she was able to have a clarifying thing. Her sister was like, I'm so sorry. I feel so guilty. I know that I treated you badly, but I really love you. I mean, they were able to do it. But the little kid within my client, she needed that acknowledgement. Mm. So we can only ever talk it out or act it out. Those are your two choices in life. So since she hadn't talked it out, she was continuing to attract situations that she could act it out because that injury was still sticky. It was still hurting her. It was still there, you know? Oh my God, that is so strong. I've never heard that before. I that's think really, I made it up. That's really freaking powerful. <laughs> Cause that, I mean, again, I'm so tactical because I can't get out of my own head. So I always like to have words like that, where it's like, oh, Lisa, you're acting out. That means you haven't talked it out yet. Like yeah. it just gives me almost like signals that I yes. can then help myself in those moments. Yep. Um, and then as you were saying about the amplification part, I actually really like that as well, because when you're over having a like an, a, let's say an abnormal reaction to something, that is a sign of maybe there's like pent up things, right? And you've brought maybe your childhood into this one interaction. So like 20 years of your sister, you yep. know, pushing you around or anything. And now you're having it on that, uh, you're acting out to your coworker who you've only known for like a couple of months. Exactly. And you're so mad that you're talking about it obsessively in therapy. Mm. I'm like, this is no way is this about some lady you've known for four months. Mm. It's just not. And understanding that all of us, I mean, this is the way the human mind works, that we will have transferences, but your awareness of what happens to your body, and like you said, having the amplified response, mm -hmm. that is the red flag to go, hey, hit pause. Who does this person remind me of? And the moment you're like, oh my God, that mean third grade teacher, that's who this person reminds me of. That's why I'm reacting to them I am the way that I am mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. But now I have a choice because I took a break, I like took a little pause, and I can respond in a mindful way, taking into consideration my life experiences mm -hmm. because we're all so unique, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love understanding all these elements because it allows me on being, like if I'm in the place of the recipient, um, where someone else is overreacting. Yes. It also allows you to have empathy towards that person to understand where they come from and know it's not about you yes. most of the time. Now, look, sometimes it probably is about you. It may be about you, but um, in those moments. But mostly it's not, though. Mm. I agree with you. Because here's the thing. To have the confidence to ask for that promotion, to have the confidence to leave that relationship or speak up when someone disrespects you, it all starts with taking brave freaking steps. So right now, I'm offering 50% off my Radical Confidence Badass Bundle. And by the end, you will be able to have the confidence to be the person you always wanted to be. So click here and begin today. Even if someone is angry with you, if they're making a whole narrative about why you did what you did, right? You're not intentionally hurting someone. Right. I'm not intentionally hurting someone. And if they go into a whole song and dance, so much of the time that has to do with their background. Now, if I love you, how you feel is most definitely my concern. And if I have done something to inspire a painful experience for you, I care about that. And you can care about that without taking responsibility for the way the person feels. But I do want to know. So it's a good distinction to make mm -hmm. where it's your feelings are your side of the street. My feelings are my side of the street. That's it. Even though we interact and when we're in committed relationships and loving friendships, we care about how the other person feels without taking it on, mm. without taking responsibility for it. That's having good emotional boundaries. That's so strong. And when I was in, as I was starting to learn about boundaries and being on both sides, I think it's super important to talk about the both sides, you being setting the boundaries and then somebody who may not realize that the other person isn't setting the boundaries with you. So now maybe you've crossed the line you didn't actually realize was a line that you've right. crossed because they haven't articulated it exactly. to you. And so in moments where you are, um, 
unsure about someone's reaction, right? Or not even unsure, you're just like, whoa, where the hell did that mm -hmm. come from? Oh my God, right? And you may then make up a story in your head about why they're doing it. Usually the story we make up is about us. Of course. Like, oh, they're upset with me because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Oh, was it that thing that I said three weeks ago, right? Like, <laughs> totally. as women, we so freaking make up an entire story. Uh -huh. um, and really they, they're on their period and they just had an argument with their partner or something like that, but you yeah. make it about you. Um, in those situations, when someone does really amplify, understanding everything you just broken down is so beautiful because in those situations when someone does now, what I try and do, immediately I used to get defensive, right? Like, oh mm -hmm. my God, what have I done? This person's coming at me, put my walls up. And over time I realized what would have to be true for this person to react like this? That's really helped me to go, oh, what's happened to that person in their life? And then that empathy piece now allows you, I feel like to have a better relationship with that person yes. because it's not you both coming at each other like that now. It's such a great point and it's so true because one of my um, psychological heroes, Dr. Harriet Lerner, says defensiveness is the arch enemy of listening. Ooh. She's so brilliant. I mean, when you think about people getting defensive or you getting defensive, that is literally the end of a meaningful dialogue. Mm. It's over. The moment someone's like, I did not, why do you always say that? We're done. There, there's no, nothing meaningful is now happening. So if someone is accusing you of something, if you know you didn't do the thing, or even if you did do the thing, being like, I see that you're upset. Let's talk about this. I'm, you know, let, let me, tell, tell me what happened for you. I want to understand. Help me understand. Mm. Right? There's ways of talking to someone we care about who's in an activated state if we cannot get activated ourselves, you know? Yeah, but when someone's coming at you, and you've, you've spoken very eloquently about how to deal with difficult people when they're just coming at you, mm -hmm. and to your point, most of us put up our walls, our defenses, that's how we've survived, right, in, yep. as, uh, up to where we are now, is to protect ourselves. And But that protection then becomes these walls and these um, the divide between you and the person versus if you're trying to have a great relationship, bringing them in and closer. Mm -hmm. But think about the boundaries. If you have rigid boundaries, which are boundaries that are too hard, and someone accuses you, you will most likely end the conversation and ghost them. Mm. You'll be like, and I'm not talking to you anymore, goodbye. Or you will deal with it and then ghost them. Like you're so much more likely, if you have rigid boundaries, to basically cut someone out of your life than you are to actually have a difficult conversation. Right. And then with people who, whose boundaries are too porous, you are take it on yourself. Mm -hmm. Just like you had said before, where you go, oh my God, you're so right, it's all me, it's all me, it's all me, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And neither one of those extremes mm -hmm. is going to create a healthy or deeper understanding between the two people. Right? We have to be able to listen to each other and not take it on. Mm -hmm. When someone's like, you did this, I'm always like, hey, I'm actually not taking that on, but I'm very interested in what your experience was, and I care that you feel that way. Please stick to your side of the street. Tell me about you. And because the thing is, that person has no idea what my intention was. I have no idea what your intention is. So to say, well, you did this for this reason, mm -hmm. that is just, literally making up a script, it's like fortune telling, it's not true. If we, and, and it's so much easier to go to anger and be like, this is why you're wrong, than it is to be vulnerable and say, this is why I'm hurt, right? Because really, when you think about anger, it's, we, we see it as sort of a primary emotion, right? A lot of people are quick to anger because it's easier to be mad than it is to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But always when, therapeutically, when I look with clients underneath their anger, inevitably, there's hurt, mm -hmm. there's pain, there's sorrow, there's sadness. And those are emotions that I feel like we want to avoid more because anger kind of feels empowering, you know? <laughs> Where sorrow does not. <laughs> oh my God, you just hit me because that is me. I actually go to anger first. As, and as you were saying, I'm like, oh my God, that's me. That's fascinating. And you're 100% right. It feels more empowering. It feels like I'm stronger 
by getting angry at something than retreating and then I feel weak. I feel like I'm being pushed around. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm being manipulated and I'm trying to like stand up for myself and show up. And so the anger does give me that like encouragement, I think, yeah. to step forward. Um, that's so powerful. But it's it, with your anger though, like with, with anger at things or injustices, that's, that's perfectly appropriate, right? Where sometimes we do use our anger to fuel mm -hmm. our, our um, po you know, pro progressive motion forward, let's say. It's more about being mindful mm -hmm. if you're interacting in personal relationships around using anger mm. to avoid vulnerability. And how many, how much do you find um, that happens in couples? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> and is that why you think that people, couples end up arguing so much because they're no longer al allowing themselves to show the vulnerability to their partner? It's, it's always, I, I think, I mean, we can make a blanket statement that it's unmet needs, mm. right? The anger, mm. there's, there's a need that is going unmet. And so if we could talk about the need and make a request, right, a need, a preference, if we could share those things, which are basically sharing your boundary preferences, rather than um, pointing out what's wrong, rather than being pissed off, mm. rather than, um, it's so easy to point out what our partner is doing wrong. Like, that's so simple. It's incredibly pedestrian. You're like, listen, dude, anybody could do that. You want to stay married for a long time? You're going to start looking at what they're doing mm -hmm. right. You're going to appreciate mm -hmm. what's right about them and not try to change them. So I think that couples who get caught in this fighting all the time and being petty, like, that's what I see, even couples that stay together. There's like a pettiness to mm. them wanting to be right. And many years ago with my husband, I just decided there's gonna, I love him for who he is. He's nuts, who's not, he's got his own neuroses, he's got his own stuff, but that I was gonna really work to like love him for who he was. So he had all these quirks, like we all do. Again, yeah. I'm no day at the beach, sister. <laughs> so I'm just saying like, I, I, he, he deserves a medal for sure. We've been together 25 years. But we would, one thing that would used to happen all the time, we would go shopping and he would always leave, <laughs> we'd be online and I would usually not bring my pocketbook and he would always leave the line to like go get something we do not need. And it would almost inevitably be more expensive olive oil. It would be like crazy. He'd be like, we really need this. I'm like, we have 40 gallons of olive oil. We don't need it. And so I used to get so mad where he, I knew he was going to do it and mm -hmm. I'd be like, what, hello, um, we're checking out, what are you doing? Mm. Then I was like, well, why? You know, this is like a weird, it's like a skip in the album. Like this is not, he's not doing this. It's not you. This is just like a weird quirk, leave him alone. So, so then I started bringing my credit card in and I'd be like, if he wasn't back, I'd just check out and just pay for it. And that would be, that would be fine. And then I just decided I was gonna not care that if I stood online and, and he was going to get his thing, I was like, just accept him. And it's unbelievable how it doesn't bother me at all now. Mm. I give away olive oil at any point when someone needs it. I have lots to give, but I also am like, there's no reason to fight about something that is stupid. And I could also choose to not go food shopping with him. He likes to food shop, he could do it. Like there are so many ways around having the same fight over and over because I find with couples, we get polarized on things. Mm -hmm. And you're like, is this really about this thing? Is it really about olive oil? And of course it wasn't, but I couldn't figure out what it was about. And I decided the relationship is great. I don't care. Mm. Feel free, get all the olive oil you want. You know, That's so powerful because um, in that situation, as we're talking about boundaries, it wasn't like you just set a boundary with him and said, hey, next time I, you cannot leave the aisle, <laughs> right? Because that's one of the, there's these beautiful nuances that we're talking about here where, yes, you set boundaries. Yes, it's a great thing for your relationship, for your, your self-care and everything like that. But there are situations like what you just laid out where it's like, no, not instead of setting a boundary with him, almost set one with yourself to be that's... like, I'm not going to leave the house and stand in line without a credit card. Now you've got a boundary that you've set within yourself Correct. and you have the control because I'm a bit of a control freak, quote unquote. Sister. Um, 
Sisters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that ends up allowing you now to not have the resentment that you even said, right, right. When we, where we started this whole interview, is that the resentment is one of the signs that you need a boundary. Yep. But maybe in this situation, the boundary is with yourself and not with the person. That is absolutely accurate. And internal boundaries, which are your boundaries with yourself, mm. have so much to do with everything. Mm. Being a boundary boss means you keep your word to yourself. Mm. Because, and when we don't, that's having disordered internal boundaries. When we say, I'm going to do this thing, or I'm going to get out of this bad relationship, or I'm going to, for my health, I'm going to walk every day for 15 minutes, or whatever it is. And so much of the time, we fall down on those things, and we have to really look at how we show up for all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, we don't do that for ourselves. So true. Um, all right, I want to talk about codependency because yes, you please. said that you mentioned that earlier um, as one of the signs that we need better boundaries. How do we know when we're codependent? Can you explain what codependency is and then we'll go deep into that? Oh, yes. So codependency, well, part of how you know goes back to the resentment because if you have a lot of resentment, you are probably dealing with codependency as well. Mm. But I'll explain what it is first. Codependency is when you are overly invested in the feeling states, the outcomes, decisions, circumstances, relationships of the people in your life to the detriment of your own internal peace, maybe your own financial, physical, spiritual well-being. Mm. Make sense? Absolutely. So now those of you watching, listening who are like, well, of course I'm invested in the happiness of the people I love. Of course you are. What I'm saying though is when we are codependently attached, we are overly invested to the point where it is disrupting our own internal experience mm. what is happening for them or not happening for them at its core codependency is an overt or covert bid to control other people's outcomes okay so how does that show as you were talking i was like oh my god i bet you so many people right now are identifying either their partners that they have codependency with mm -hmm. or their parents. Oh yeah. So let's talk about both of those. So once we've identified, right? Okay, these are yep. the people, as you just broke it down, I'm sure everyone just names popped into people's heads. Yes. So now um, we understand why that could be bad, right? Because now you're giving yourself over to the detriment of your own self-esteem, your yep. own self-care, your own mindset. Yep. Um, how do we start to change that um, in a way, hopefully, that doesn't impact our relationship with that person negatively. Well, here's the thing. There's no way to change a relationship dance and not have it impact the relationship. Mm. So I don't know that it will necessarily have to be negative, but when we change our boundary dances, which is what becoming less codependent means, people are going to notice. Mm -hmm. And probably in the beginning, they're not going to like it. And you're not that fragile. Hopefully your relationships are not that fragile. So back to, with regular codependency, quote unquote, people in my practice, I, I created a term because the codependency that was popularized in the 70s and 80s, Melody Beatty, codependent no more, gotta be involved with the addict, it's all about enabling. My, in my therapy practice, I had incredibly high functioning women in my practice. So I would identify and say, hey, what I'm noticing, what you're talking about, that's a codependent relational pattern. And they would be like, yeah, no way, lady. Wrong. You're, you have no idea what's going on. I'm the one. I'm making all the dough. I'm the one everyone comes to. I'm the answer person. I'm always fixing all the things for all the people. I'm not dependent on squat, lady. Mm -hmm. They're all dependent on me. And I was like, oh, my clients don't know what codependency is. They do not realize. Mm -hmm. So that I changed it and I created a new moniker and I'm actually writing my second book and it's about this right now, High Functioning Codependency. Dude, I am first in line to buy that book. <laughs> because when I heard you talk about this, like it's so funny because all the high functioning women are just like, what do you mean? Like I'm not codependent, I got my shit. Like yep. you kind of think of yourself as, as um, you can't be independent. Yeah. And you think of yourself almost as hyper independent, but when you're overly invested mm. in fixing the lives of others, you're not being independent. So once a high functioning codependency, which is basically the same description, except you're so highly capable, you make it look easy. 
So people do come to you. Mm -hmm. You are the answer person. You, you do have 400 balls in the air and you are somehow managing to do it all. But what I've found in my practice over the last 25 years is that we're doing it all, but at the expense of ourselves, mm -hmm. our health, our inner peace, our joy, being known, just simply being actually known instead of just being utilitarian, mm -hmm. right? Like being useful mm -hmm. to the people in our lives, which is a big part of being a high functioning codependent. Ooh. But who actually knows us? We know the people in our lives. I know what everyone eats, everyone's birthday, who's not talking to who, I got it all. Mm -hmm. Like we, we know everyone. Mm -hmm. And when you really think about it, how many people know you that intimately? Because we're so busy being like, I got it, it's fine, it's good, no problems, I'm good, you know? Yeah, so how do you, in those situations, um, because there's, you, are, you can identify yourself as one, right? And then mm -hmm. go, okay, maybe this isn't good for me, but you get a lot of validation from mm -hmm. it. You get a lot of your self-esteem from it. Mm -hmm. So I can understand why so often so many of us stay there because we may fear where are we gonna get our validation from if I'm not the one people turn to, yep. if I'm not seen as useful. Right, well, let, let me, I'll share a quick story of what helped me yeah. pivot mm. and stop, right? I still have the desire to help everyone in the world, Why? <laughs> but doing it in a more healthy way now. But I had a therapist who helped me realize that by inserting myself into the middle of other people's problems, even if they wanted me to, right? That it was literally me being like, centering their problem on me. Mm. And it's basically them saying, I'm like a loser, I don't have the answer, I don't know the answer, but you know the answer. And by me, quote unquote, giving the answer, I was agreeing mm. with them. Like, you're right, I know better than you what you should do in your life. And that is simply untrue. And I thought I was doing it out of love. I was like, I'm all Mother Teresa. Like I literally <laughs> thought, like, I'm just a lover like that, you know. I'm just a giver, I'm just like that. And when that realization came around, and she was like, Terry, you are the way you are. I was trying to micromanage my sister's life that was falling apart at the time or whatever. And she said, do you know why you're doing this? And I was like, uh, no, because I love her and because I don't want her to be in this abusive relationship or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she was like, that may be true, but that's not why. She's like, you've spent 20 years creating a pretty harmonious, healthy life. And her life being a dumpster fire is really messing with your peace. Mm -hmm. You really want it to stop so that you can regain your internal peace. So you see your sister as a problem to be fixed. You see people as like projects mm. to be managed, to be helped. I can make you better. I know what you should do. All of that bandwidth that you're leaking for other people, that needs to be going in. You need to be worrying about your original injuries, your life. Are you drawing boundaries? How are you communicating? But instead, you're dispersing it mm. all over town. And you, know, you don't have endless energy as a human being. But that shifted for me because I think that it was very ego uh, dystonic, we say, where it, it cla it's like not the way that I experienced myself, mm -hmm. but I really got it. I was like, wow, how presumptuous of me to think that I know what everyone else should be doing. That is presumptuous. Am I God? Of course I'm not. And it's so much more loving instead of to fix people, to be with people in their pain. So now when people come to me to fix their problems, I say, well, wait a minute. What do you think you should do? What does your gut instinct say? Because your gut is great. I have no doubt you're gonna figure this out because literally you're the only one who can, but I'm here. I'll brainstorm with you, I'll hold your hand, mm -hmm. I'll go have a cup of tea. But it's having faith that other people have the right to be sovereign from our opinions, mm -hmm. even if we're good at problem solving. But it's not our problem to solve. And ultimately what my therapist said to me about my sister's situation is she was like, 
Terry, what makes you think you know? What lessons your sister needs to learn in this life? And I was like, well, I don't think she needs to learn it this way. And she was like, but that's not for you to say. Mm. And I really got it. I was like, oh my God, I am not the, no, you know, the, the do all end all for other people's lives. And that it was control. I wanted control. I didn't, their suffering, their distress was so distressing to me that I wanted to do anything to end it, but it wasn't my right. And I'm so much better now, I mean, many years later, at realizing, hey, that's their side of the street and I love them. And I can say, hey, I'm here for you. Let me know how I can best support you without thinking I need to make a phone call or set them up with something or give them money or whatever it is I was trying to do to fix. Mm. How do you start to do that then? Because that's so amazing. It's just, it sounds really freaking hard, right? Especially if you have been the one that they do turn to and they don't even see it as a problem, right? Imagine you're sitting, I'm not quite sure, but like your sister's like, oh my God, every time they have a problem, they're gonna come to you because they know that you're gonna be there. They yep. know that you're the one that's gonna pour their heart and soul. And so you actually have a special bond because you actually both get along because you feel needed, they turn to you. And yep. so in changing that, as you said earlier, yep. the, the boundary dance, how do you start to navigate that boundary dance with that person that keeps turning to you where you found your self-esteem from? How do you start to unwind that so that you get to the place where you still have a good relationship with them, but now you're not pouring yourself into it and having the energy leaks, like you said? Yep. Well, can you see that you can still be with them and just not think you have the answer? So the same person will still come to you. Mm -hmm. And instead of being like, I know exactly what you should do, your, your script changes mm. to be like, all right, let's start with this. What do you think you should do? Tell me what your gut instincts say. They go, I don't know. But if you did know, what would it be? Because that's really, I think, where we should start with problem solving mm. is what do you think? Because honestly, and sometimes I would tell people, like I was sort of changing the dance and saying, you know, I know in the past, I've always been readily willing to give you my, you know, quote unquote expert two cents. But what I've realized is that truthfully, you know more about what you should do than I do. And that a lot of times I was auto advice giving because it made your pain made me uncomfortable. But I'm, I'm really down to be with you right now and to be in this moment. But I really do want to know what you think. That was so beautiful because part of what I would worry about is that they now feel abandoned, yeah. right? And you're actually doing it to better your relationship. You're actually doing it for their sake. So they start to get stronger on their own, but you want to be supportive. So giving words like that is so amazing and so beautiful. And I would absolutely do that. I would be honest and upfront yep. for my own sake so that they didn't feel abandoned. Yes. And that you, you don't have to worry right, that, that they're going to think you're now like not available to exactly, them. Exactly, yeah. But I think what you'll find happens. Right now, for two days only, I'm offering 50% off the Radical Confidence Badass Bundle. That includes my best-selling book, Radical Confidence, my 10-part confidence course, and the ultimate guide to badass confidence. Click here and begin today. Let's do this. Is that your relationships deepen so much when we start relating to people as equals and that they have the right to whatever life they're mm. having, whatever, even if they're making mistakes. You know, my mother had this great thing on her refrigerator all growing up that said, I promise not to take credit for your accomplishments if you promise not to blame me for your mistakes. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. All mothers need that to give to their kids. Yes, and I feel like it's, it's very appropriate when it comes to this too, right? Because when you're overly controlling other people and yeah. overly giving advice, sometimes people take your advice and then the thing is a disaster. And then they come back and they're like, yeah, thanks, Lise. So I did what you said. Mm. And now my friend's not talking to me, mm. you know? Yeah. That is not your side of the street. Me telling someone what to do is not my side of the street. So whatever happens, that's their life. Mm. Just like your life is your life. And there's something so beautiful where on the other side of not being an auto fixer and not being codependently attached to folks is the, the sweetest, the deepest intimacy, the actual being known in your own life too, and knowing the people that you love. 
asking expansive questions. That is a love language mm. unto itself. Listening in a real way, not just being a wait to talker, you know, like actually listening to what, how people feel. Is there more you want to say about that? Then what happened? Like be a good listener. That is love. We just want to talk. Mm. Do you know how like your husband always, not yours, but in general, husbands, um, <laughs> want to fix everything, you know? Oh, yeah, At yeah, least yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Obviously, they stopped now. If you're still together, you figured oh, out. Oh, he's still uh, very much the same, though. We all, all, on autopilot, he goes into wanting to fix it, and I go into, I just want you to listen. <laughs> but at least you can have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My husband is well, he's well trained to say, how can I best support you right mm. now, babe? Are we brainstorming? Mm. Do you want my opinion? <laughs> like, he's so clear. Nine times out of ten, I don't. I want you to know I'm in pain or I'm frustrated or I'm upset. And I want you to just say, tell me more about that. Mm. Hold space and be present with me. That makes me feel loved. Because of course, it's my life. Of course, I'm going to figure out what to do. Obviously, duh. Mm. But someone being willing to sort of be in that foxhole of painful emotions and to not fix it's hard. Oh, but it's so um, worth it. And it really does build beautiful, reciprocal, healthy relationships. Yeah. Oh, my God. So one of my friends, Nadra, she's a beautiful poet. And she spoke about um, she'd had her heart broken so much. She felt so broken. And when she was then single, she met a guy that was basically where she was a couple of years before. So he was really broken. And she found so much validation and self-esteem in trying to help fix him. Mm. And what she ended up realizing is, is that he can only fix himself and that actually it became the worst thing for their relationship um, instead of this beautiful thing. But in the moment, in that t real time, it felt good for her. Of course. Because it does feel good. What did you What did you say at the top when we were talking about this? You were like, you get validation, mm -hmm. right? You get appreciation. Right. You got people being like, oh, you always have the right words. You always know what to say. Mm -hmm. You always have the best advice. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean that we never share our honest opinion or advice. It means if you are auto advice giving, then you are not listening. Mm -hmm. So if even if you're going to eventually tell the person your thoughts, don't have that be what we lead with. Lead knowing that other people know what they should do in their life, even if they don't know. The not knowing is most likely mm -hmm. part of how they're going to learn their lessons in life, as my therapist asked me all those years ago, you know? Yeah. Love that. Um, you said earlier about anger, um, but you've also spoken about suppressed anger being a sign of the fact that, hey, you've actually got a poor boundary and you probably need to um, implement one. Mm -hmm. How do you identify when you've got suppressed anger? Um, and then how do we start to set a boundary there? Well, part of it is many of us, you know, for in my family of origin, anger was um, what I call a forbidden emotion. Oh. So like nobody was allowed to be mad. Now you, on the other hand, Greek family. Greek family, <laughs> probably wasn't the same. Yeah, no, My waspy family, everyone was like, use the right fork and nobody say anything. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a healthy relationship to anger. So I needed to suppress the anger and turn it into something acceptable, which would be crying or sadness mm -hmm. or being upset. And if I was angry, I would say, I would use the code word upset. Mm -hmm. um, and I see this with my therapy clients a lot too, a lot of misnaming. If, if you have certain forbidden emotions, anger being probably the most popular one, that you would, I had a client who used to always say, I was so annoyed, but she was enraged. And I would always say, hey, you know, you look so much more than annoyed. Are you sure annoyed mm -hmm. is what you were feeling? And she was like, no, you know, it's anger. I was like, correct. So in here, at the very least, <laughs> mm. let's, let's properly name our emotions. Because Why could that be a bad thing? A, it's incorrect. It's inaccurate. So it's like me saying, I'm upset when I'm angry. Why is that bad? Because I'm not upset. Mm. I'm angry. This is the truth. Mm. The feeling is actual anger. And when we water it down to make it more palatable for others, mm -hmm. we are abandoning ourselves, right? So we want to be accurate. And it doesn't mean you need to tell everyone in the world exactly how you feel. No, 
<laughs> only your VIPs, only the people that matter, only the people who you can trust in a way with your most tender heart. So I wouldn't make myself vulnerable to all the people. Right. But if I'm angry with someone, whether it's a work relationship, whether it's something else, I will clearly state I, that I was, that I am. I'm, I'm angry that you came 20 minutes late after we already had this conversation. And I wanna make a simple request that if you're gonna be late again, you give me a heads up. I would have, I would have walked instead of taking a cab. Mm. But with the lack of consideration, you not letting me know, I took a freaking cab and then I waited here for 20 minutes. That is not the best use of my time. And if you had said, it upset me a little, that person may not have actually taken it as seriously as you felt it. Exactly. Got it. So being succinct, accurate, honest, is so important because exactly right. If I was like, well, I was a little bummed. <laughs> That's not the same. You're I was- like, I was fucking livid. <laughs> exactly. I was pissed. I wasn't a little bummed. But a lot of times we like want to smooth it out. Oh, so true. At our own expense mm. though, right? So back to how do you know if you're having suppressed anger or you're whatever? I mean, look at your family of origin. Look at how your family related to anger. How did the adults in your life relate to anger? Was it allowable? I w it was so clear. Again, nobody, I didn't get any inner office memo telling me you can't be angry in this household. I just knew it. Mm. This, these are the rules of engagement that no one needs to tell you. It's mm. just what you experienced. It's just not what we did. So I had no good model of behavior for how do I appropriately share my anger. I would talk myself out of it. I would feel like you're angry, it must be you. You know, when I was younger after a million, seven years of therapy, obviously I'm fine with my anger now. But if you're someone who's wondering, resentment is anger. Mm. If you're feeling resentment, most likely something happened that initially you felt angry about. Then it sort of boils into <laughs> resentment. You know what I mean? Like it's like this low grade resentment that just kind of hangs around. So think about that for yourself. Do, do you think that anger is a forbidden emotion for you, if you're wondering how you feel? Um, if you, another indication that you're suppressing your anger is that you don't say anything, you don't say anything, you don't say anything, you don't say anything, <laughs> and then you explode <laughs> like a volcano. That is very common when we are repressing mm -hmm. anger, and then it just gets to a point where you're like a powder keg and it just, there's no more, there's no more ability to suppress it. And then a lot of times we say things, really mean things we don't mean. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't feel good, we're not heard. Right? When you explode like a volcano, people just wanna get the hell away from you or, or we'll start a brawl, but it's, it, it isn't an effective way of communicating, obviously, which is why we don't wanna let things build up. And you know this, instead of making, you, if you make a mental note when something happens where you're like, oh yeah, just another reason Betty is an idiot, right? You put it in the <laughs> file cabinet, just another reason Bob, I can't stand him, put it in the file cabinet. What you're, you're literally setting yourself up. So this file cabinet's not free. Mm. That takes your bandwidth. Mm. If you ruminate about past injuries, things that people did, that's not free, that's costing you. So I'm really all about nipping something in the bud. Like, as soon as it happens, hey, I noticed there was a weird vibe in the meeting today. I want to know, is there something going on between you and this person? Because that's, that's what I saw. Mm. God, you have a quote actually that hits me and actually very in line with this. If you have something to say, silence is a lie. <laughs> yes. I was like, oh damn, snap, that's strong. Right? And, and it's, it's very true, right? Silence is a lie. You are abandoning yourself in not saying what is on your mind. And again, the more you do this, the easier it gets. Because I feel mm. like for people, mm. one of the biggest mm. things is language. How do I start the boundary conversation? How, how do I bring it up? So many clients would be like, I was right there. I was literally in the room. And then I just, no words came and I just turned around and left. Yeah. So how do we start? And I think that part of it is we want to practice, but get some sentence starters. That, that are easy. You can always start, especially with people we care about. We can start setting a boundary. We, I call them sweeteners, right? Where you start with the truth. I so appreciate that you always think about me. And I can't go on Wednesday night, but I hope you guys have a great time. Like, because for some folks, it's really hard to say no. Mm. 
to say no to other people, to let someone down. And so it can be easier if you start with just some sweetness, as long as the sweetness is true, mm. right? We're not using mm. it to manipulate, but if it's someone you love, you know, you can say it, you're so thoughtful. And I love that about you, thank you. And I can't do this, right? Um, you can start any request that you have with, and this is Marshall Rosenberg's work, which is amazing. I'd like to make a simple request because there's nothing you could ask someone, truly, that is not a simple request. Doesn't mean they're gonna do it, mm -hmm. but I'd like to make a simple request that you let me know if you're gonna be late next time. Text me so I can walk and not take an Uber or whatever, you mm -hmm. know? I'd like to make a simple request that you let me finish my story before you interject with your story. Okay, so let's say you, you're in a conversation with someone uh -huh. and you say that, um, but they don't listen because it sounds very, it's very polite. Yep. Um, does there become an escalation process? Yes, there does, and that's a great point. And if I was in a conversation with someone and they were interrupting, I wouldn't make the simple request. I would do this. I would say, oh, hey, hey, one sec. Please let me finish what I'm saying because I promise you I will forget. By the time you're done with your story, I will not know what I was saying. So I use humor mm -hmm. like that. I put it on myself sometimes, depends on the person. But I love, I love using our um, body language mm -hmm as ways of supporting our boundaries. So if someone is interrupting, the one second, the one, one second. Finger up. One yeah. finger up is not super aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's really effective. It makes people notice. Mm -hmm. And usually it makes them stop. Mm -hmm. If someone is being aggressive in some way, misogynistic comment, racial, homophobic, whatever, then I'm a full hand up. Ah, I'm a full hand, right. which is like, literally stop. And if it's someone, I sometimes I will just say, no, thank you. <laughs> no, that's a... Just no, Uncle Bob on that racist mm -hmm. comment. No, thank you. You know, where, and I could be specific. It depends on the person. You know, like when you're talking about family gatherings, because you and I were talking about that a little bit before we got started. It depends on if who I'm talking to is an intimate relationship where I want to provide context because I want them to know me mm. more accurately, right? And when you're talking to people that you're not that close to, or extended family, let's just say, I don't know that I, I need to provide that context, right? What I wanna make sure I'm not doing is convincing Uncle Bob that I have a right to not listen to his racist bullshit. Oh my God, that, that's almost like the natural, my natural inclination is to explain. Oh yeah, no. We're not explaining. We're not explaining. Because, and you go in that conversation uh, just telling yourself, no matter what, when something comes up, I'm not explaining. Yes. Be aware though, like part of it is, don't make ourselves feel bad. Be aware of our tendencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're feeling like if you're approval based, there, there's all of these different ways that you can manage conversations, especially at family gatherings, let's say, mm -hmm. where People are going to say the most messed up things to you. They're gonna ask you the most inappropriate questions. The most intimate stuff, well, you know. Why, why don't you have kids? <laughs> why don't you eat wheat? Why don't you, who, why didn't, where's the person you brought to last year's mm -hmm. gathering, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why'd you get a divorce? Oh, I heard you had a miscarriage. Literally, people will say this to your face. So one of the one of my re favorite responses is from actually Kasha Urbaniak, who's a power dynamic expert. She's so brilliant. And if someone says, "What happened with your miscarriage?" You can literally you question the questioner's question. Mm -hmm. So according to Kasha, when someone is asking us a question, they're dominating us. They're the dom and we're the sub in that moment. When you flip that script and you say to the person who just asked you about your miscarriage, why would you want to know that? Mm -hmm. Literally, you question their question. Or my favorite of hers is, why would you ask me that? Mm -hmm. Now the onus is on that nosy mother effer to explain Oh, you know what, dude, it was just my morbid curiosity. I just wanted to make you talk about something incredibly painful because I'm bored. Mm -hmm. hmm. And of course, people don't say that. But whenever I use this, why, why would you ask me that? People go, oh, I don't know, I'm just making conversation. I'm like, yeah, we could talk about something else.
great. Okay, that's really strong. What happens in those moments, though, where you know sometimes the person's going to gaslight you? It's like, but why are you so sensitive? Yep. You know, and now it's all on you. Oh, I love it. When they try to, now they're trying to flip the script. Yeah. To be the dom yeah. and you be the sub. Why are you so sensitive? You can say, we're not talking about my sensitivity. I'm asking you <laughs> why you would ask me that question at grandma's Christmas party. Mm. Really? Yeah. Really, Aunt Betty? Am I really talking about my miscarriage over stuffed celery? I don't think I am. My audience really wants to know about partnerships when you're in relationships and then very much family dynamics, especially when it comes to parents, because these are always the very hard things to navigate. Yep. Um, and sometimes a lot of us, women especially, will just bite our tongue because um, let's say you've been brought up, you've said it many times, yep. to be the good girl. People turn to you, you feel good about it, but now you go to these family gatherings and it's not even questioning, it's just remarks where it's like, oh, what a shame about John. I love John, you know, yep. like the, the partner that you were with maybe yep. last yep. year. And it's like, what a shame John's gone. And now they're just making snide little comments yep. that you feel are inappropriate, that just demean you. Yep. But now you're retreating into your whole childhood behavior that you've always yep. had, which is being silent, not speaking up. Yep, I have ideas. I have thoughts. If someone says, oh, what a shame about John, I would, do, I would do one of a few things. One is joining them and I would say, it is, what a bloody shame. <laughs> Done, leave it. I love that so much. Like, I will so not be provoked by you, cousin Bobby. You don't have the power to provoke me, hello? No way. So one is joining where they're like, that's terrible. You go, the worst, it's literally the worst. When you go into those things, your job is to be as unprovocable as possible. Mm. People at family gatherings are like, you've changed, right? Like, and they think it's an insult. And I always say, oh my God, thank you so much for <laughs> noticing. I've I worked really hard at changing. exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. That makes me so happy. Mm -hmm. What other things do people say? Why don't you eat gluten? There's nothing wrong with gluten. Yeah. You can say, oh, come on, please tell me we have something more interesting to talk about than my diet, than what I eat, than my dietary restrictions. So as long as you're not provoked, there's easy ways of distracting people, especially if they're not people who are like your close homies, as you would say in your life, your mm -hmm. VIPs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna see cousin Betty three times removed twice a year or once a year. So. It doesn't matter if, if they're being inappropriate or asking intrusive questions. The most important thing is that you're not giving up information that makes you unduly vulnerable to people who may not be emotionally trustworthy. Mm. And is that the same rule that applies whether it's family members or strangers? Yes. Strangers, though, if it's not family members, I could be, I could be a little more sassy with strangers. Mm. I mean, not in New York because you never know who's got a gun. But I mean, in general, like just telling the truth if so, or just stopping a conversation. I'm much more likely to stop a conversation with the hand up or the one finger up, especially in New York, people would say inappropriate stuff. I just will say, no thanks, mm. right, as we were talking about before. I think to have good conversational boundaries, which does tie into childhood training, being the good girl, and especially that gets kicked up when we're in family situations, is that you've got to be prepared, right? Part of being successful at these family gatherings is being prepared. You know who the players are? You know who the drunks are? Don't hang out with them. So be strategic about who you spend your time with. You can get out of any conversation by saying, you know, excuse me, I have to use the ladies' room. What are they gonna say, no you don't? Mm -hmm. Then just don't go back to that corner of the party, go somewhere else. Um, if someone is judging you, I can't believe you got a divorce. He, he was the best thing that ever happened to you, let's just say. You can just say, hey, I'm not talking about this. That is so strong. It's obviously um, very difficult, I think, for people to do in real time. And so for me, um, one thing I do is just embrace, you had said it earlier, you know who those people are. And so I've now stopped worrying about if they're going to say something and just go, you know what, they are. 
worrying about it, Lisa, is just almost giving you more anxiety. Yep. You know you know them. You've known them your whole life. So you know they're going to say something. Yep. And now it is up to you how I respond. Do I get emotional even though I know it's coming? Do I have a script? You've given us so many beautiful scripts. Like, What do I say in this situation or do I excuse myself? Yep. And going into a situation just accepting it, knowing how to handle or giving myself options on how to handle it allows me to walk into the situation without anxiety. Yes, and to feel free. Yeah. I also like to use humor and this might sound weird but it's a really effective um, intervention as we would say in therapy where if someone says like something that they're trying to get your goat like mm -hmm, they're trying mm -hmm. to just literally saying oh, oh my god you are so funny. you kill me <laughs> you kill me oh my god I'm gonna go get a drink like literally laughing in their face de-escalating they're trying to get you that even if they said, I can't, you know, I can't believe you let him go. It was the best thing that ever happened to you. If you start laughing and being like, oh my God, you, you just a crack up. You just kill me. <laughs> what are they going to do? Like it deescalates. Oh, I love that. It really does work. Mm -hmm. And then you get to walk away and they're trying to provoke you. But what you're saying in laughing and being like, oh my God, you're killing me is that you're not you're not taking the bait. Mm -hmm. They're trying to bait you and you're like, nope, I'm not. Would you like a cookie? I'm going to get one, right? Mm -hmm. And you can be done with that conversation. I like to use humor too, as much as I possibly can. A little bit of levity goes a long way in these family situations. Even if someone is trying to hurt you or, or trying to provoke you, maybe they're not trying to hurt you, but they're nosy or they're bored or I don't know. That's their side of the street, right? We don't know. But you going in exactly as you just said, prepared with different ways of being, bring some of those scripts that I provide for you. We can put some in the show notes if people want them yeah. so that you have it in your back pocket and you go, oh, these are the problem people. There's like three people who I know are going to say something. So I need to decide how that I'm not going to be provocable because that's kind of what the person is into doing. Mm. Avoid them. And also, do, you don't have to go to every gathering that you're invited to. What do they say? You don't have to, you don't have to um, attend every fight you're invited to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you don't. Distract. If they say something, you say, oh wait, I wanted to ask about, I heard that you got a new job. Tell me about that. People just want to talk about themselves. You can do a distraction so easily, but go, you got to think about it ahead of time. Oh my God, God, I really hope people at home right now just wrote all those things down. You just gave so many freaking nuggets of gold of how people can handle those situations with such grace. It's beautiful. And I do like that almost like that final thing of like, you know, you don't have to go because it's going to take time. And you've said it before about languages. Boundary is like a language. It's like if you were all of a sudden to go say, I want to learn a language, you wouldn't expect to know it after two hours of listening to, you know, a, a, an exactly. audible, you would actually have to wax on, wax off, practice, it would Correct. take years. And so with what you're saying, with setting these boundaries, we understand that it's not gonna be, you know, easy, one and done, super quick, and you know, you've got it. And so if you're not at the place yet to be able to say things like that, to be able to laugh it off, because even yep. laughing it off, especially if it's still a, a deep-seated wound that you yeah. have, it is harder to laugh at. Yes. So in those situations, I'm not there yet. Terry, I love you. That's great advice. I'm just not there yet. Yeah. Being able to say, then I'm, I choose not to go yes. for your own mental health, I think is so beautiful. Yeah. Like as long as you always say, that's going to be my priority, my mental health. Yes. And while I love my family and I want to see them and I, you know, do enjoy certain moments, going there right now would be detrimental to my, my mental health. I think that is so powerful. Yes, and put limits too. Mm. Put limits. You can say, Aunt Betty, I can come. I must leave by 820. Then leave by 820. Mm. People are like, don't leave. You're like, oh, no, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. So warning people that, you know, I have, I have, something, I have somewhere else to go, even if you don't. Even if one hour with this particular group of folks is enough for you, mm -hmm. that's your right. And we don't have to say that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's your right to opt out at any point because it's your friggin' life. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then also you said, um, don't, don't fake a consequence. Like you actually have to see that consequence through. Because how many of us, like, especially I think in relationships, oh, yeah. back in the day when I was younger, before my marriage with my husband, but it was like, if you, I'm going to leave you. You know, and there's yep. always like throwing these threats out as a consequence in the hope that they would then relinquish. 
But then if they don't, you don't follow through. So you're basically in, inevitably teaching them that they can, you can throw out a consequence yep. and you're not going to see it through. Yes. So part of the thing with consequences is we have different categories of people. You have a boundary first timer, which is someone you've never had actually used the words to make a boundary request. You have the repeat offenders, and then we have the boundary destroyers, which is a whole other conversation. Narcissists, you know, different um, cluster B personality disorders, whatever. So over here, first timers and repeat offenders. If you've already tried to establish the boundary, you have. Maybe the person has agreed to the boundary, but they keep stepping over it. You have to come up with a consequence that makes sense for what the thing is. So if it's somebody is late and doesn't let you know, and they said they will, and now they're, you're sitting at a restaurant, let's say, because they're late again, the consequence is you're not gonna meet them out at a restaurant. You may love them. Maybe they're really time challenged, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you gotta be offering a lot to me. If you're time challenged, because I'm super on time, you, you gotta be offering a whole lot of other things that I really love about you. Mm. But then maybe we only meet at my house or we only meet at my apartment so that if you're late, I won't care. I'll still be working and doing whatever. Like coming up with consequences where, or I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait for you for dinner. You know, I'm gonna, you can make your own dinner when you come home if you're gonna be late and not let me know. Mm. That's like a, that's um, a consequence that's commensurate to what is the violation basically. But there has to be a consequence because as human beings, what is the one and only thing that motivates us to change? A little bit of pain, mm -hmm. a little bit of, oh, I don't want you not to meet me mm -hmm. out for dinner anymore. Like, like, I'll be sad if we don't do that anymore. Okay, well then figure out how to get here on time, <laughs> right? Because that is my boundary. That is my uh, non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Because not all boundaries are non-negotiable. You know, Lisa, it's like some things are just preferences. I prefer coffee over tea or whatever it is. But non-negotiable boundaries are really important that we let the people in, that we're in relationships with know how we feel about things because we're all different. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with whatever your non-negotiables are. There's nothing wrong with that. I know you would, you would said in an interview that with you and Tom, it was like, n never cheat, never get physical. Yeah. Right? Those are non-negotiable. Like those things will end our marriage if either one of them happened. Yeah. Clearly, you're still together. Obviously, they did not. <laughs> but you were very um, astute early on to be like, this is, this is what you're signing on for, pal. Mm. <laughs> so if this doesn't work for you, you might not want to be in this relationship with me because these are non-negotiable deal breakers. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it was because I had seen a lot of other women say that they... Um, won't accept, I'm just going to be honest here, they said they wouldn't accept their partner to cheat, they cheered and they accept, they took them back. Yep. And each to their own, like zero judgment, if that's, sure. go ham. I just knew I wouldn't be able to take him back. And so to me, I needed him to know that. Like I didn't want yep. him to even contemplate that maybe there was a possibility <laughs> of a persuasion that I would take him back. <laughs> right. And so it was out of the sake of our relationship yep. that I ended up from the get-go out of fear because I'd yep. seen so many people where they had had physically abusive partners, they still took them back. And it was just, it was a deal breaker for me. Yep. And I thought, well, shouldn't he know this? Yes, he should. He, he should, that's yeah. information he should know. Yeah. And then he has decisions to make. Yeah. And maybe neither one of those things would ever be in the realm of possibility for him. But your side of the street was clean because you shared it. And what's interesting is as I was talking just now, I realized a big part of it is, I wanted to say it out loud to reaffirm it in my own head. Mm -hmm. Because I actually want to be strong enough to know that I can leave if he cheated on me. Yes. And there's that part of me that I think once upon a time when I first met him, I didn't feel as strong as I am now. Yeah. And because I didn't know who I was. And so I think that was partly it as well, is saying it out loud to make sure I wouldn't yes. go back on my words. Totally, totally. So going back to the consequences thing, saying them out loud, if you say them out loud, you better be willing to see it through. Correct. Yeah. Um, you dropped earlier something that I really want to talk about that so much of my audience talks about and wants to have more information about narcissistic mothers. Because in family gatherings, in certain situations where you've, you know, just given amazing advice, it may not work on a narcissistic mother. If you don't mind breaking down the different types um, and how they can show up, and then how we can start to navigate setting boundaries with our narcissistic mothers in situations of family gatherings. It's so painful. First of all, I'm giving everyone who has a narcissistic mother a virtual hug right now. 
-hmm. because it's brutal. It's really hard. A lot of times with narcissistic mothers in particular, mothers and daughters, it's a very specific thing. I actually have a course called the Mother Wound Course motivated by so many of my people mm -hmm. being like, what do I do? Um, it's painful because a lot of times narcissistic mothers are incredibly charming. A lot of times they're very beautiful because they're kind of vain. Your friends are like, your mother is the coolest, you know, and only you know what's happening behind closed doors and how potentially competitive your mother is with you, how your mother sees you as an extension of herself, takes credit for your accomplishments, right? Like the thing on my mother's refrigerator. No, that would not be on the refrigerator <laughs> for a narcissistic mother because she's like, oh yeah, everything good that you are is because of me, mm -hmm. basically. Um, cannot be happy for you. It's so sad. Like literally can't because it's like something good happening for you can feel like something bad happening to her as a narcissistic mother. Like there's not enough. It's such a scarcity mindset. Oh, trusting a narcissistic mother? No. They're going to use whatever you share with them against you at some point. So painful. I feel like at family gatherings, I don't know. It, it's so hard. Like you're going to have your mother, if you have a narcissistic mother at a family gathering, they're going to be telling your stories as if they are their own kind of. Mm. Like you won't have any ability to shine. Something amazing happens in your life. Your mother will literally be telling you, telling your story to the other people, you know? Yeah. So how do you do it? Drop boundaries? I'd, I wouldn't give a narcissistic mother unlimited access to your most tender heart, to your life, to your information. They want to make friends with your friends. Mm -hmm. They want to insert themselves into your relationships. So stepping back, sometimes it's really helpful if you have distance, meaning you physically move away from your family. Even if it's only 20 minutes or 30 minutes, a lot of my clients have moved way for, as far away as they could possibly get mm -hmm. because physical boundaries help. Because with a narcissistic mother in particular, a lot of times they're very smothering. There's different types. So there's like the rejecting kind of narcissistic mother. Then there's the more smothering type. I've done um, quite a bit of this in my, on my YouTube channel. Um, and one of really one of my most popular videos is how daughters of narcissistic mothers can survive to thrive. Mm. Like how, how do we do it for ourselves? Yeah. And part of how we do it is we find replacement mothers, right? We find healthy people who can mother us. So if you have these wounds are unhealed, a lot of times you'll find narcissistic friends, self-absorbed friends, controlling friends who make you feel the same crappy way that your narcissistic mother makes you feel. But as you're healing and if you're thinking about it, you'll also be attracted to earth mama type women who are so happy for you to shine, who, who do all the things that a narcissistic mother is incapable of doing. And that is a, can be a really um, emotionally corrective mm. experience by having an older friend who just thinks you're friggin' great, find a mentor who is not jealous of you, who is very secure in themselves. And those things can really make a difference in how you feel at gatherings. Stay away from your narcissistic mother. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I literally don't know. Because especially in a, a group setting, depending on how explosive the narcissist is, it's like the perfect setup to have like a brawl. So I almost feel like creating distance is safer mm -hmm. for the daughter. Let, let the mother do whatever they're doing. Unless, unless the mother's like, tell the story of this and tell that. And then you start telling the story and then they co-opt the story. That's, that's not great. So, so maybe if your narcissistic mother wants you to tell the story of something, you can tell her, she can tell the story and then just go to another part of the, <laughs> go to another part of the party mm -hmm. because trying to set boundaries, if someone is actually diagnosable, because here's the thing, probably six and a half percent of the U S has narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, those statistics change, but we're not talking about one in three people. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, I, 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 so you may have yeah. a self-absorbed 
mother. So the re let's just establish that yeah. the what it means if you're really diagnosable is that you actually cannot have empathy or compassion for another person. Right? This is the telltale thing. This is what differentiates a narcissistic mother between from a self-absorbed mother, a self-centered mother, a selfish mother, and all of them exist too, but they may still have the capacity mm. to have compassion for you. And those relationships are worth setting boundaries in and having honest conversations in. Because a lot of times, a selfish mother, insecure, didn't get her needs met in childhood, we know there's all the reasons. But if you have an honest conversation, even if they're defensive at first, they have the capacity to change. Mm. That's not really accurate with a narcissistic mother. That if they're truly diagnosable, and other people may disagree, I'm just telling you my therapeutic experience in 25 years, that it's unlikely that a narcissist is going to gain insight into their illness and change their hurtful mm. behavior. It's very unlikely. And so as being the daughter, let's say, or the child, um, just acceptance and just like knowing that that's what they're going to be like and then coming up with either don't go to the event, stay away from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, even though that sounds like a drag, but if it's true. knowing what someone is capable of can spare us from smashing our head against a brick wall over and over and over again and seeking for them to be different mm -hmm. than they are capable of being. But you can have emotionally corrective experiences in other relationships. Get into therapy, talk about it, join groups, look online. There's so much free stuff out there about this. You are so not alone. Mm. Also, if anyone is having this experience, dude, you are not alone. And you can absolutely heal from this experience, but you will not heal if you, if the little kid in you keeps thinking that your mother is going to be capable of loving you the way that you want to be loved. Because that just sets you up to be injured over and over mm. again. So self-protection is really, I think, so important. God, yeah, especially when it comes to parents, so many of us want to, our parents to be proud of us. And so giving yourself unrealistic expectations based on what your parents have given you, um, like recognizing that I think is super powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and then the changing someone part of it is very important to talk about because especially when we're talking about setting boundaries, mm -hmm. you do need them to adapt. And so at what point is it your responsibility to set the boundary, talk about the boundary, make it super clear, set them up for success, need, knowing though that they have to change somewhat to adapt to this new boundary. Mm -hmm. um, is it just as a boundary setter, that's what you do? You can just set it and then you have to step back and just see if they're the person that is looking to change and adapt. Um, or is there any type of persuasion? Like how do you navigate that dance where it's a little difficult for that yep. person to onboard, if you will. Yep. And here's the thing. It, it's not persuading, but you bring up a really great point, is that we have to expect, especially in long-established relationships, mm -hmm. that it's going to take a minute. Mm -hmm. And that you may need to set that boundary more than once and remind the person, hey, when we talked last Tuesday, you said that you would take the garbage out without me asking. I don't know. I'm thinking of all these pedestrian examples. I can't think of anything else. But you get the point, right? Yeah. And the person says, I'm sorry, you know, you're right. I am going to, okay, well, how can I, how, is there a way I can support you in remembering? So maybe we should, let's put notes on, mm -hmm. the, on the door and maybe that would be helpful. Like we can support it, but it's in establishing the boundary and letting the person know if I have to continually remind you, that really makes me feel unimportant, mm. marginalized, and that you're just placating me which also makes me angry and upset. So we have the conversations, but we will expect there's gonna be some pushback when we change our boundary dances, because a lot of times other people were benefiting mightily mm. from our lack of boundaries, and now it's gonna be, they're gonna to have to put in a certain amount of effort to change their dance, and then sometimes we compromise. Mm. Sometimes they go, you know what? You're right, I can't remember it. Let's. We have the person who comes in to clean. Let's have it be part of this other person's job. Okay. I just want it done. I don't care how it gets done. Mm -hmm. So like maybe we have to brainstorm a different way of whatever the thing is. So I think the more we can talk, 
the easier it gets. And don't, if you cannot take it personally, right? You set a boundary once. I remember when I first started this process, I was like, Whew, glad that's over. <laughs> Never doing that again. Yeah. And that's not accurate. We will most likely need to do it again. But the more we talk, I love to have um, couples do what I call, it's just a state of the union where it can be once a week, once every other week, where we purposefully just have a breakfast where we talk. Vic and I do it in bed on Sundays where we just talk like about, how's it going? How you doing? This was amazing. I appreciated you did this for me. Mm. I felt really loved. It was so sweet that we pulled around in the middle of the day, whatever the thing is, right? That that we love. So I always start with gratitudes and stuff that was great. And then what do we need to clean up? Mm. I, was, I, was, I have to be honest, I was kind of frustrated when this happened. We've talked about it, but I really want to ask you to please be more mindful of whatever. Or he'll say to me, I was frustrated, whatever the thing is. But we're normalizing having real conversations about real things, but we make it fun. We do it in a loving way. It's never like we have to talk because hi, nobody ever wants to talk <laughs> when you say we have to talk. So never say that. It's the worst. Yeah, no one ever does. Um, and then the, taking it personally, that is so me. And I'm sure there's so many other people as well, um, because it takes you just enough courage to set the boundary. You feel like you've been articulate. You feel like they've heard you. You've had the conversation. Um, and then let's say a month later, you start to see them slip. And so I I used to take that person. It's like, mm -hmm. what the hell, what? Because I don't speak up all of a sudden that I'm, they yeah. think I'm okay with this again. Yeah. And I would make it about me and not about like human nature that people just forget. People yeah. drop things when they've got more things on their plate. Um, and so just to repeat, the boundary I found of just like, hey, not sure if you've realized, but you know, a month yep. ago we had this discussion and right now it doesn't seem like you're fulfilling that. I would yep. just like to remind you and not feeling bad about re bringing it up, but yep. doing it in a way that isn't accusatory. Yes. But also being honest about the fact that I talk about this a lot with my, with my husband and with my kids and whatever, that if you're going to take, give me your word and take responsibility for something, that whole job is yours. Mm -hmm. It's no more on my list of to do. I don't want to have to check back with you. I want you to just effing do it because you said you would. Mm -hmm. And when I say I'm going to do it, I do it. And there's a whole thing about emotional labor that if I, now I'm not saying we don't have to sometimes remind about a boundary and that's okay. But I mean, in general, where if someone says they're going to do something and then they're like, but what's the number of the plumber and where's the thing mm -hmm. and what and what what exactly am I saying? You know what I mean? You're like, hi, that's literally like me doing it. So I think there is something about emotional labor. And I would say to my husband, listen, when you say you're going to do it, I appreciate you doing the whole thing from the beginning to the end and me not having to remind you that makes me feel loved and considered. Mm -hmm. And then it makes me know I can count on you. And, it, I, and I can, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. that's what he does from the beginning to, to the end, rather than half doing it or doing it a little bit or asking me all the questions. So then I just go, oh, it's just easier if I do it because oh, yeah. I think we fall into that. And that's disordered boundaries too. Mm -hmm. I love that you said also, it's like, this makes me feel X, Y, and Z, because there isn't an argument that can be had about your feelings. Correct. Although people might try. <laughs> yeah, that's so you true. You have no reason to feel that way. Oh, You're like, how the hell would you know? <laughs> yes, I do. I already feel that way. Like, mm. that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I hear you've got a mastermind coming up. I do. Tell me about the mastermind. I'm actually t doing calls right now um, for people who are interested in the mastermind. It's going to be six months. It's for ambitious women who are really, really, really tired. <laughs> who want to learn how to do what they're doing or get to the next level. So it's a business mindset, but it's also emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. boundaries, effective communication, self-esteem, self-care, all of that. So wherever people are on their journey, this is going to be customized to them. So it's six months, we start in January. So if anyone is interested, where can they go and find out? terrycole.com forward slash flourish. Nice. And where can they get your book and follow you? They can follow me on Instagram at Terry Cole. Um, and the book is at boundarybossbook.com. 
and I still have a million bonuses and all of that because we're still talking about boundaries. Hell yeah. Guys, guys, go check out her book. Go check out her masterclass. Go check out everything she's doing. She has so many nuggets of gold on how to set boundaries, how to stand up for yourself, how to make sure that no one manipulates you because you see the tactics coming. It's all in here. So go check it out. Guys, if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu and drop in the comments what was the one piece of nugget of gold that really hit you really hard. I want to hear from you guys. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace. If you want to hear the three boundaries every person must set in a relationship, click here. I'm gonna start with some common misconceptions about boundaries, because I think it's really important to get this down first. People often think that boundaries are about telling someone else what to do, controlling other people, that they're manipulative, that they're...